This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We are doing today's broadcast about the suicide of Aaron Swartz, a 26-year-old cyber activist, social justice activist, co-founder of Reddit. Um, he developed RSS when he was 14 years old. Our guest today is Harvard Law professor Lawrence Lessig, his mentor, his friend for many years, speaking to us from Harvard. I'm Amy Goodman. Over the weekend, Aaron's family released this statement. They said, quote, Aaron's death is not simply a personal tragedy. It's the product of a criminal justice system rife with intimidation and prosecutorial overreach. Decisions made by officials in the Massachusetts U.S. Attorney's Office and at MIT contributed to his death. MIT also released a statement. And I'd like to read that here. On Sunday, we reached out to MIT for comment. This is part of the statement the MIT president, Raphael Reif, sent to the MIT community regarding Aaron's death. He wrote, quote, I will not attempt to summarize here the complex events of the past two years. Now is a time for everyone involved to reflect on their actions, and that includes all of us at MIT. I've asked Professor Hal Abelson to lead a thorough analysis of MIT's involvement from the time that we first perceived unusual activity on our network in fall 2010 up to the present. I've asked that this analysis describe the options MIT had and the decisions MIT made in order to understand and to learn from the actions MIT took. I'll share the report with the MIT community when I receive it. I also want to read the statement of JSTOR. That's the nonprofit that uh, is the archive of all of the documents that Aaron was downloading. Over the weekend, JSTOR expressed deep condolences to the Swartz family and maintained the case had been instigated by the U.S. Attorney's Office. They wrote, quote, the case is one that we ourselves had regretted being drawn into from the outset. Since JSTOR's mission is to foster widespread access to the world's body of scholarly knowledge at the same time as one of the largest archives of scholarly literature in the world, we must be careful stewards of the information entrusted to us by the owners and creators of that content. To that end, Aaron returned the data he had in his possession, and JSTOR settled any civil claims we might have had against him in June 2011. And now I want to play a comment of Aaron Swartz himself about JSTOR, about these documents. Um, uh, this was a comment made by Aaron Swartz at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in October of 2010. He spoke about JSTOR. I am going to give you one example of something not as big as saving Congress, but something important that you can do right here at your own school. It just requires you willing to get your shoes a little bit muddy. By virtue of being students at a major U.S. university, I assume that you have access to a wide variety of scholarly journals. Pretty much every major university in the United States pays these sort of licensing fees to organizations like JSTOR and Thompson and ISI to get access to scholarly journals that the rest of the world can't read. And these licensing fees are substantial, and they're so substantial that people who are studying in India instead of studying in the United States don't have this kind of access. They're locked out from all of these journals. They're locked out from our entire scientific legacy. I mean, a lot of these journal articles, they go back to the Enlightenment. Every time someone has written down a scientific paper, it's been scanned and digitized and put in these collections. That is a legacy that has been brought to us by the history of people doing interesting work, the history of scientists. It's a legacy that should belong to us as a commons, as a people, but instead, it's been locked up and put online by a handful of for-profit corporations who then try and get the maximum profit they can out of it. Now, there are people, good people, trying to change this with the open access movement. So all journals going forward, they're encouraging them to publish their work as open access, open on the Internet, available for download by everybody, available for free copying and perhaps even modification with attribution and notice. That was Aaron Swartz speaking, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, October 2010, about JSTOR. That was before he was arrested. Professor Lawrence Lessig, um, the significance of uh, what Aaron was dedicating his life to before we move on to the speech that he gave last year to play in full. Yeah, he was dedicating his life to building a world, a nation at least, but a world that was as idealistic as, as he was. And, and he was impatient with us, and he was disappointed with us, 
with all of us as we moved through this fight. And, and he, as he grew impatient, he, he called on people to do more. And, and it is incredibly hard for all of us who were close to him to accept the recognition that maybe if we had done more, maybe if we had done more, this wouldn't have seemed so bleak to him. Maybe if we had stopped this prosecution. I received an email from JSTOR four days before Aaron died uh, from the president of JSTOR announcing, celebrating that JSTOR was going to release all of these journal articles to anybody around the world who wanted access, exactly what Aaron was fighting for. And uh, I didn't have time to send it to Aaron. I, I, was, on, I was traveling. But I, I looked forward to seeing him again. I had just seen him the week before and celebrating that this is what had happened. So all of us think there are a thousand things we could have done. A thousand things we could have done and we have to do. Because Aaron Swartz is now an icon, an ideal. He's what we will be fighting for, all of us, for the rest of our lives. Professor Lessig, on November 27, 2007, Aaron blogged about his depressed mood. He said, surely there have been times when you've been sad. Perhaps a loved one has abandoned you or a plan has gone horribly awry. Your face falls. Perhaps you cry. You feel worthless. You wonder whether it's worth going on. Everything you think about seems bleak. The things you've done, the things you hope to do, the people around you. You want to lie in bed and keep the lights off. Depressed mood is like that, only it doesn't come for any reason, and it doesn't go for any either. What about Aaron's state of mind, how he kept up his spirits, especially during this very, very difficult time, also struggling with depression? Yeah, Aaron was depressed. He was rationally depressed. You know, he, he was losing everything because his government was overreaching in the most ridiculous way to persecute him, not just because of this, because, because of what he had done before, liberating government documents that were supposed to be in the public domain. Of course he was depressed. He wasn't depressed because he had no loving parents. He did have loving parents who did everything they could for him, or because he didn't have loving friends. Every time you saw Aaron, he was surrounded by five or ten different people who loved and respected and worked with him. He was depressed because he was increasingly recognizing that the idealism he brought to this fight maybe wasn't enough. When he saw all of his wealth gone, and he recognized his parents were going to have to mortgage their house so he could afford a lawyer to fight a government that treated him as if he were 9-11 terrorists, as if, it, as if what he was doing was threatening the infrastructure of the United States. When he saw that and he recognized how, how incredibly difficult that fight was going to be, of course he was depressed. Now, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't know whether psych there was something wrong with him because of, you know, beyond the rational reason he had to be depressed. But I don't, I, don't, I don't have patience for people who want to say, oh, this was just a crazy person. This was just a person with a psychological problem who killed himself. No. This was somebody, this was somebody who was pushed to the edge by what I think of as a kind of bullying by our government, a bullying by our government. And just as we hold people responsible when their bullying leads to tragedy, I hope Carmen Artiz does what MIT did. The U.S. And attorney. Hold a pro the U.S. attorney and, and lead, a, lead an investigation. Ask somebody independent to look at what happened here and explain to America, is this what the United States government is? Professor Lessig, we want to end with the words of Aaron himself. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.